And welcome back to Reason and Theology, everyone. Your host, Michael, joined by special guest, William Albrecht. How are you, sir? I am great. Doing even better now with a <laughs> cold beer. Yes, yeah, some Corona. <laughs> we, we had yep. a little bit of difficulty getting these. So the first store we went to, we tried to get some Modelo's. Yeah. But then they did not accept cards. So we handed them cash. Yeah, they didn't accept cash either. So. I, I, didn't, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. But hey, we, we got some. But we uh, ended up some securing beer. some. So <laughs> we, we, did. we got some Coronas at the end of the day. We sure so did. Here we are. I feel like we're on Drink Champs, though, because I see all the, <laughs> all those all the Coronas there, yep. and beers out every, everywhere. So we'll do a beer stream. That, that's, that's how we'll, we'll pitch this one. We've done it before. Yeah, it's been I a while. Know, right? But yeah. not in person. This Never is in the person. first time in person. Be the first time? Yeah, it's been a while since we did that. That was probably yeah. like. A year and a half ago. Or, it's been a while, yeah. Yeah, because honestly, it started RT about three years ago, just yeah. a little over three years ago. Yep. And then we started doing videos together probably two years. About two years, yeah. In, in fact, I think I had you on the first time was Purgatory. Purgatory, I remember now. Yep. Yeah. It was yeah. Purgatory. You're right. I was like, man, okay, well, let's, let's get them on more. And yeah, so, yeah, I remember yeah, that. Yeah, so it's been, it's been awesome having That's you been as a blast. Host. And like I said, good to have you here in person. Oh, it's so a blast. what we're doing is talking about the papacy in this yeah. one. This is a fun topic. You know, we covered the Immaculate Conception, another one that often comes up with Protestant circles and Orthodox circles especially, is the papacy. So yeah. I wanted to talk about that. Now, in the last video... You mentioned that for you, though there are other factors that yep. came in to your conversion from Protestantism to Catholicism, the papacy was a big one. Yeah. Tell me why. Yeah, well, the, it, it really played a, a, a very big role. Number one, when I converted from Protestantism, but of course, as I considered my way to Orthodoxy and Catholicism, then, of course, it becomes a whole different angle where you look at yeah. evidence for the papacy. And I began to look at the history of the papacy throughout the early church, Pope St. Clement of Rome very early on, yeah. and on and on, leading all the way up to and beyond Pope St. Leo the Great. Yeah. And I, I became ever more convinced of the incredible role of the pope throughout history. Now... Of course, I may be getting too far ahead of myself. Before that, of course, as we know very well, the clear foundation of the papacy is in Scripture. Sure. Uh, it, it truly is. So that laid the groundwork for me. Scripture, of course, that was very clear, mm. to steering me out of Protestantism. But then, of course, a lot of the claims that we can make for the yeah. papacy, we know very well the Orthodox will say, okay, well, I can be on board with that. Yeah. But we know that that then changes when we go into history. And in my opinion, the evidence for the papacy uh, on the Catholic side is much stronger. Do you feel like on the Catholic side, some of the evidence that has been put forward sometimes is <clears throat> reading too much into it? Not that there isn't strong evidence, yeah. but what I'm saying is in popular apologetic circles. Yeah. Do you feel like some of the evidence that is put forward is... Yeah, not necessarily the best that we have to offer. I do. I think that there is a tendency to grab papal sound bites, Peter sound bites, where you will have a quote of Peter as being the head of the church, yeah. or or a Peter being uh, the leader of the apostles, mm -hmm. and we will utilize that as an evidence of the papacy. And and as you know very well, Michael, a lot of those quotes the Orthodox can very well give an aim into. Yeah. And to add to that, uh, Oriental Orthodox as well. Right. So what separates us um, when it comes to how we view the papacy? Mm -hmm. I think that we need to go beyond mere quote bites. Sure. But here's another thing. I think that once we do go beyond that and we look at the context, in my opinion, scripturally and in the early church, there really is no other other position. Now, the papacy is most certainly one of those distinctive teachings that if you were to embrace it, it's like the only real option that you yeah. could go to. 
is Catholicism. Yep. But you then mentioned there, okay, but there is a certain form of the papacy, if you will, that Orthodox can accept. Yeah. How different do you think is maybe a high Orthodox version of the papacy is compared to the Catholic version? I think it is different enough that would warrant one to to convert to Catholicism. Yeah. I truly do think it's that different. Um, I think that we are living in a time where people are looking at the quotes of the papacy and people that are orthodox and they realize, well, this doesn't quite jive with the way my view of the church is today. So they begin to read uh, into history kinds of words or teachings that they're they're kind of yeah. ripping out of the context. Yeah, like, yeah. For example, one one incredible example I could think of are the words of Pope St. Leo the Great, the Tome okay. of Leo at Chalcedon. Okay. Uh, it's, it's amazingly evident that Pope St. Leo the Great viewed his position as that of papal supremacy. Sure. There's just really no way around that. Right. And the language is very clear. And to deny that to me uh, is, is uh, you're going to be doing mental gymnastics. Sure. Yeah, Leo most certainly held to what I would understand to be <clears throat> the view of Vatican I on yeah. papal supremacy. I, I don't think that that is disputable. What I guess my concern is whenever I see some Catholics pointing to the language in, at Chalcedon, yeah. um, where it says, you know, Peter has spoken through yeah. Leo, right? Um, Im immediately thinking that that automatically proves right. the Catholic view or that the Chalcedonian fathers sure. accepted the Catholic view of the papacy. I'm not saying that they didn't, mm -hmm. but what I'm saying is, what, or I guess what I'm asking is, do you think that that alone is enough to really settle I don't. the matter? <laughs> no, I don't. I think that you must supplement it with much yes. more. Yes. Uh, l number one, look at uh, how was the Tome of Leo accepted or received. Right. And then uh, supplement that with uh, how did Leo view himself, Pope right. St. Leo the Great. And then if he viewed himself in this manner, where was the uproar on the uh, side of those that accepted his Tome? And the other thing, as well as we know very well, is that Pope St. Leo the Great's tome was essentially saying the same thing as uh, St. Cyril was saying in, uh, at Ephesus in his mm -hmm. Christological mm -hmm. position. So then when we see that, we realize that Pope St. Leo the Great uh, was in line with the great Christological teachings. And we realize how much the teachings at Chalcedon impacted the church. Yeah. Because let me be very clear with you, today... You can listen to a Protestant uh, individual talking about Christology, and they'll talk about Chalcedon. Right. Look at the, the, the wide-ranging effect right. it's had. But then look at the claims Pope St. Leo the Great made for himself. Yeah. He clearly viewed a lot of He viewed the power of those keys as being given to the successor, St. Peter. And he thought that he exercised them in a unique oh, yeah. way. Absolutely. Not that he wouldn't, wouldn't say that other bishops... Um, you know, aren't successors to St. Peter. He, I think he would, but that doesn't mean that he wouldn't claim a unique version of papal succession for the Bishop of Rome. And I think, Michael, that point is the number one we, the one we have to focus on. Yeah. Because what I hear very often in popular apologetics is, oh, well, Peter is the only one that got the keys. So, of course, the Pope has a special role. Then they fail to realize that the language lends itself to the fact that we recognize that the keys were received by the other bishops as well, by the other apostles. But St. Peter, in a very mm -hmm. special mm -hmm. way, mm -hmm. received them. And how are they able to utilize those as well when they are in union that, with yeah, the Pope, man. with St. Peter, the successor of St. Peter? I think that that's the one area where they get tripped up on. I, I think so, and I'm glad you brought up this point because... It is true that the other apostles received the keys of the kingdom right. as well. Sometimes I think we oversell our position by th yeah. saying that only Peter received. No. Yeah. The rest of the apostles also received the keys of the yep. kingdom. But that doesn't mean that we can't say that Peter received them in a unique way. No doubt. Or that we could maybe speak about the apostles receiving the keys of the kingdom through Peter. Yep. There's that kind of language that I've seen as well. And I think that language there is probably the clearest mm -hmm. if we emphasize that. But the other thing that people, they, they, they get tripped up on, Michael, is the fact that 
they'll say, okay, well, if the other apostles received the keys, well, well then why do we need, why yeah. do we need a St. Peter? Well, you need a St. Peter because they were able to utilize them by being in union with the head mm-hmm. um, of the apostles, of the band of the apostles, that being St. Peter. I think they tend to forget that and the fact that we know the office of bishop will continue. We're told directly in Acts chapter 1, verse 20, mm-hmm. when the office is desolate of the bishop. It uses the Greek episkopos, or episcopi, I forget the exact Greek word there. Uh, that w- will be fulfilled. It'll be filled. Yeah. Thus, bishops continue. Mm-hmm. And we realize that that's very clear for St. Peter, those that would follow him. And I've noticed they tend to really, whether it be evangelical or orthodox, yeah. tend to not understand that. You know, for those that say, as you mentioned there, that, okay, well, why do we need a St. Peter? Why yep. do we need a head? It, it, my, my thing is, it's like saying, why do you need a body? Why, why do you need a head on a body? Um, yeah. the, the body can't exist without a head. It cannot. Um, yeah. it, it seems like there does have to be that center of authority, the center of unity yep. to really even be able to identify a particular communion. You have to have that. So it, it, it seems that I don't know how the church could function without a head. Now, yeah. what people will say is, well, Jesus is the head. <laughs> so what, what do you say in response? Yeah, so without a doubt, we recognize Christ is the head. Sure. We recognize Christ holds the key. Uh, nobody's arguing that, but, we, but uh, Peter, St. Peter, is the vicarious rock. We, mm-hmm. That has got to be recognized, number one. Mm-hmm. That takes nothing away yeah. from Christ. But the fact of the matter is, Michael, is that Christ set up a visible church with a visible hierarchy yeah. and a visible head. And when you kind of uh, use that as a you know a fallback, and say, well, you know, Christ is a leader. We agree. The, the church has always agreed. But how is the visible hierarchy mentioned in scripture and it's very clear how it is mentioned uh we hearken to matthew chapter 16 all the time but there are other passages luke chapter 22 right uh john 21 or 21 john 21 and the language is very strong there saint peter is we're literally told in the greek that he's a shepherd Mm -hmm. in a very special role what kind of a shepherd over the flock yeah so my my comment would be that we have got that shepherd We have that visible hierarchy as laid out in Scripture. And my hope would be that all of these other churches have that as well. But in order to have that, they would have to become Catholic. Those people would have to become Catholic. Some people would say, but okay, you know, I understand what you're saying, but it seems like Vatican I and its language and claims about the Pope, it just seems anachronistic, they would claim. And they would say that, Look, this speaks about an authority to the papacy that just did not exist yeah. in the first millennium. What would you say to those who would claim that this kind of authority doesn't exist in the first millennium? I would point to multiple examples. Number one, even though it's very early on, you clearly have seeds of that in Pope St. Clement of Rome, mm-hmm. without a doubt, where he's, what he's talking, when he's talking to the flock, he's doing it in an authoritative manner. He clearly views himself as that head of the church. But we go beyond there. Mm-hmm. It's very clear in the language of St. Irenaeus that there is a certain model that is set up in a certain way. So if we look in early church history and we look at the claims of some of these popes, for instance, as I brought up Pope St. Cle- uh, Pope St. Leo the Great, yeah. and we go onward, even at classic example, read the language of the Second Council of Nicaea. There's no way it's pretty around. Pretty strong, right? Oh, it's, uh, and that's at an ecumenical council. That's an ecumenical council. This is very, very strong, um, incredibly strong. Mm-hmm. So, if we have that kind of language, this is first millennium. Yeah. Uh, this is the first millennium, and if we have that kind of language there, the church is agreeing upon that kind of language. Then there is a, a foundation set there. Now, I know that we've got fans, and we we love them that are Oriental Orthodox mm-hmm. that are tuning in, they're going to say, hey, well, we weren't there at Nicaea too. Mm-hmm. So what about us? So the way to answer that, in my opinion, is to look at beforehand. Sure. And if you look at beforehand, if you look at in the Syriac Fathers, mm-hmm. they have strong language when they talk about the papacy as well. And there's, look, Michael, mm-hmm. there's no way around the language of the Bible. 
Yeah. It's very clear the model that is laid out there. And that model is that, very clear of the papacy, the way the Catholic Church points it out. Now, come on, no, nobody's going to argue that the way the papacy looks at the time of Vatican I, and, mm. uh, they're, they're not saying, well, the papacy has to look like this yeah. in the 100s. The church has been persecuted, you know. The church has developed. Doctrine has developed. There's no argument about that. But doctrine developing is not the same thing as saying that doctrine has been created and there is no example of this in history. Yeah, and, you know, the unfolding of the doctrine yeah. in, in history is another thing, too. So it's a good point. You bring up the word in Orthodox there. Yeah. Well, they do accept Ephesus. Sure do. And what's interesting there is you have at Ephesus Philip the Legate, the yep. representative of the Pope, making some pretty serious claims yep. in front of the Council Fathers about the Bishop of Rome that is really the seeds of Vatican I, in yep. my estimation. Yeah, no doubt. He makes them openly, and the Council Fathers accept it. Yeah, yeah, there's no doubt about that. So um, you bring up a very good example there because the church is not broken off at that time at mm -hmm. Ephesus. So mm -hmm. to me, uh, the best that they can do is try to claim that maybe later on that that wasn't accepted. It was mm -hmm. accepted there, though. There is no doubt mm -hmm. about it. There is no doubt that it was accepted there. So when we talk about the Oriental Orthodox, that to me mm. is a problem for them All right. because they reject the papacy. But it becomes an even greater problem for the Eastern Orthodox yeah. because we have so many examples, right. especially at the Second Council of Nicaea. And this is what I would ask them. Mm -hmm. Which church most resembles that church of the Second Council of Nicaea in language? Yeah. And it would be without a doubt the Catholic Church. Yeah, you have Nicaea too. I would also also argue Agatha at the Six Ecumenical no Council. Doubt. No doubt. Um, I I would even note Vigilius and the way yeah. he views himself at oh, the yeah. Fifth Council, um, and then at the Fourth Council, Leo, he most certainly thought his tone was definitive yeah. prior to an Ecumenical Council ruling on the matter. And what's even more interesting is he overturns a canon of the Council of Chalcedon yep. by the authority of St. Peter. So here he thinks that he is able to ratify or annul yep. by the authority of St. Peter a canon from an ecumenical council. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, which, if you think about it, the precedent has been set at the Council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. Mm. Now, this, there, nobody's going to doubt or argue mm -hmm. that the head of the church in Jerusalem was uh, James. Nobody's yeah, yeah. going to argue sure, that. Sure, of course. But who is the one that makes the decision? Yeah. And James, of course. Yeah. Uh, after James, of course, James agrees with it. Sure. But it is St. Peter who does yeah. it. And that's a big, big factor. Because you look at the commentary in Acts 15 by St. Jerome, and he's noting the very same thing. Sure. Calling Peter, St. Peter, the prime mover of the council. So... We're not infected with Peter syndrome yeah. when we begin to quote passages from the Bible and then quote commentary on the way the fathers view those passages. And Acts 15 is a big one. It really is important because we see a kernel of how that leadership was in St. Peter. And of course, it becomes much more fleshed out through church history. And mm -hmm. you bring up a great example there with the striking down of the canon. Yeah, That is a tough one to overcome there because somebody that did not believe they had that authority vested yeah. in them from Christ would not have even had the audacity mm -hmm. to do such a thing. But the Pope does do it. And that is a precedence that we see that the language from Vatican I... Look, I, I like to bring up... Um, what uh, what our mutual friend, Dr. Fustigi, says. Yeah. Look, at Vatican I, they were aware of all these claims. They were aware of them. And they were aware that this language and the actions of past popes, this isn't a novelty. They were aware of these past actions. And I think that's an important thing to ponder upon. You know, what's, what's interesting, too, is that... So, when you talk about Acts 15 there... Mm -hmm. I, I agree that Peter was uh, the one who makes the judgment there yeah. and, and settles the matter and everybody falls silent at his decision. But I would say even if Peter wasn't the one who settled the matter, yeah. let's, let's just pretend for a moment that it was James. James, yeah. Okay. Um, 
that's actually not a big deal right because at an ecumenical council it's not the pope who necessarily yeah. has to settle the issue that's the fantastic it could, point. It could be the bishops who settle yeah. the issue and the pope merely ratifies ratifies it, it later i mean that's most certainly the case i see it's multiple yeah multi nicaea yeah and multiple other councils even the most recent ecumenical council yeah. vatican ii you don't have any ex cathedra teachings at vatican ii that's from correct. the pope you have the bishops teaching things and yep. arguably de- some, some things definitively. Lumen, yep. G- Lumen Gentium 21, for example. You have them putting things forward and the Pope is merely just ratifying yep. them. He's not saying, oh, by the authority of St. Peter, I declare definitively. He's not doing that. So I don't even think that we have to look back at um, Acts 15 and, and automatically look for something ex cathedra yeah. because that's not actually how the pope normally functions 100%. in relation to councils yeah outside of a council yeah he might issue something ex cathedra yeah. but for but for something like that i think we could point to the tome of leo of course. as an example of something yeah. ex cathedra yep um but you know what what would you say to people who say but okay if you have the tome of leo why did we need a council why council on yeah, that's a very, very good uh, question. Well, the gathering of the people there at Calston was viewed as quite necessary. Now, Pope St. Leo, his tome was not objected to. We mm-hmm. have no record of anyone there saying, okay, well, Leo presented this and, you know, now it has to be, uh, you know, right. considered right. or what have you. So, despite him viewing his tome, and th- this comes from, uh, a gentleman who I don't agree with everything he says, but uh, the Reverend Dr. Price. Yeah. What will he tell you? He'll tell you the very same thing. I say, look, he said uh, they view the necessity. They viewed it as necessary to gather a council. Yeah. But not once was the Pope ever under the impression that the tome wouldn't be accepted. Right. Ever. So I think that's an important point to point out. Uh, the other point would be. I'm not aware of any controversy at all on Pope St. Leo's tome. Right. Um, I'm trying to think of what else, what other points are, that are, well, are brought up. To... I, what, what I think is interesting, and this is something that Eric has, has brought up, Eric Ibarra, yeah. um, is that Leo in his corpus notes that he consents to the calling yeah. of Chalcedon so that a fuller judgment yeah. can be expressed, even though he already thought his tone right. was definitive. Yeah. He is fine with an ecumenical council also providing its consent to it That's so correct. that a fuller expression can be made. And, and somebody would say, well, look, if this thing is already definitive, yeah. why a fuller expression? Well, it, it's one thing for the Pope to teach something ex cathedra. Yeah. It's another for all of the bishops of the world to also say, and we are in agreement with this That's and correct. express their you know, express their fuller judgment. Yep. What, what do you think of that? Yeah, I think that's a fantastic point that you bring up there. And that's the exact point that uh, Dr. Price, Reverend Dr. Price brings up as well. So I think that's a really, really good point. Um, unfortunately, you're going to get an objection. Now, mm-hmm. from Eastern Ortho- from the Eastern Orthodox perspective, mm-hmm. uh, I don't think they have a good case. I think what you just laid out there was fantastic. Now, the objection we get from the Oriental Orthodox, as you know, you've heard this uh, very often, uh, would be that reunion, and this is from certain people that are Oriental Orthodox, they'll say, well, reunion could never be possible with us, or I could never imagine myself being in communion with Rome because (laughs) uh, that tome of Leo, they'll say, you know exactly where I'm going, uh, is heterodox, is utilizing language that is at odds with the language utilized by our guy. As you know very well, their guy is uh, St. Cyril of Alexandria. Mm -hmm. Now, we've done shows in the past before. In fact, we've asked the Reverend Dr. Price, point blank, on his thoughts on the Christology of the tome of Leo. Yeah. And this is all very relevant because we we will do a deep analysis of the language of Pope St. Leo's tome. Yeah. He is essentially utilizing the very same Christology yeah. as St. Cyril. So if that is going to be their primary argument for rejecting Chalcedon, they're going to have to look for another one. I wholeheartedly agree, yeah. and I think that that's a point well worth noting. Now, okay, so let's see where we should go with this. Would you... What would you say to somebody who says, look, I understand what you're saying in the first millennium. I, I see the attestation that you're referring to in the yeah. councils and these fathers. But Pope Francis? Yeah. 
you you really think that Pope Francis meets the description of the rock and yep. and all the things that they say about the Sea of St. Peter? It just seems like that they're you know yep. there's a point of disconnect there. Now, so so in other words, their their hang up is that okay, I can see this historically, but I just don't know about Pope Francis. Yeah. You know? The number one thing I would say is I have never been the biggest fan of Pope no, Francis no. ever, but he is the vicar of Christ. Sure, he is a valid pope. Right. He is the pope. And in his defense, Michael, I think he gets ripped out of context so much. I think so. I really, really do. Now, uh, on the other side, to be give both perspectives a fair sure. shake, do I think he can be more precise sometimes? Yeah. I do. Yeah. I truly do. Yeah. But I don't think Pope Francis is heretical. I, th I know he's the yeah. pope. He's the valid successor of St. Peter. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of good he does do. I truly do. I really do think, uh, first off, we villainize him so much, yeah. the media does, uh, the rad trad media does, uh, and, and I'm naming anyone in particular. Sure. Well, why not focus on his help and outreach to the poor, yeah. to the needy? Why not look at that? Why not look at the good as well? Um, so again, I've never been the biggest fan, but he does fulfill that. And hey, we haven't had many, we haven't had every single pope be uh, out front when their language of being sure. the rock. We yeah. haven't. So Pope Francis is a different kind of pope, but he's a pope. Uh, he truly is a pope. And I'd add uh, another thing. Uh, I have heard the argument in, arguments against Pope Francis. I've seen the videos put forth uh, claiming, well, look, uh, he's denying this and this Catholic doctrine. Yeah. I have not seen a case for a denial of any of these Catholic doctrines. Not a good one. No, not a good case at all. A lot of misunderstanding, though. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, when you, when you get past the knee-jerk reactions and really start to look into things yeah. okay yeah i don't i don't think that he's teaching heresy no and yes i agree sometimes he is misrepresented sure. um by the media um whether it's from rad trad media or just secular media oh yeah but sometimes i think that he says problematic things yeah and he's not being misrepresented Agreed. he really is saying something problematic no doubt yeah now here's my problem with that yeah I wish Pope Francis were more precise. I wish he was more precise. Now, another thing that, that uh, I think is problematic, there's a, a very liberal atheist guy that interviews him very often, mm -hmm. and they'll never run with it. And it'll get denied by uh, Vatican media. It'll get denied sometimes. Sometimes they don't even waste their time with it. Yeah. To me, if he's going to continue that individual right. running with these stories, making them up or whatever... Stop giving him private interviews. The fact that he Give continues to go to him kind of makes me think that there might be some truth to them. Which is scandalous <laughs> yeah. and unfortunate. Yeah. Um, in Pope Francis' official writings, there's no denial of things like the eternality of hell. Right. There's no denial of Mary being immaculately conceived because I've heard people claim that he denies that. Mm -hmm. In his official writings, there is nothing heterodox. The claim is made when he does off-the-cuff remarks, um, weddings on a plate, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and other kinds of things. Mm -hmm. The media are ready to, to pounce. I do think he should be more precise. Yeah. And I think this is, this is just, just the plain truth. I think he makes comments that are unfortunate sometimes. I really do. I, I agree. But nothing that I would say that makes me think that okay the claims that yeah. the papacy you know makes about itself are, are falsifiable or falsified yeah. that's a really yeah. good way to put it yeah yeah I, I don't think he falsifies the claims no he might make them challenging to substantiate right. in some cases yeah. but falsifying no i haven't seen good evidence for that no um i do have one mm. other thing yeah, yeah and it does get brought up get brought up often mm. i think perhaps for uh, people that Look at the papacy. Mm. Some of them tend to get hung up on Pope Honorius. Yeah. This is one that, that tends to uh, be a thorn in the side of, of, of many. Uh, so I don't think the case of Pope Honorius, which is a curious case, mm -hmm. I don't think it falsifies claims to papal infallibility right. by any means. Right. I've heard the argument, having been made, that it does... But I think if you examine and you study the issue, I don't think that it does. Mm -hmm. um, I think Eric has put forth really good yeah. points in that issue. I think you have as well. And uh, I've appreciated the 
evolution of language in, yeah. in, in Dr. Fastigi on that issue as well. Now, not to say that Dr. Fastigi was wrong before, but uh, I think he's uh, studied the issue more and uh, come up with a, a response that is cogent to history. What is his position? I'm trying to think what it is off him. His position is now he, he says, that, look, um, it's very possible that on this historical matter, these councils were in error. And yeah. Yeah. You know what? Uh, uh, not on the teachings. Right. But, that's correct. But on the on, anathema. On this historical matter. That's on correct. The anathema, on the right. anathema. And, yeah. and, and I would agree that at the very least, theoretically, yeah. anathemas of a person. Yep. Yeah do not fall within the scope of the church's infallibility. That's a fantastic point. I, I would maintain yep. that thesis. Now, clearly what they teach definitively on faith and morals right. is, is with, no doubt. without a doubt definitive, yes. that can be reversed. But an anathema of an, an individual depends on facts, yeah. factual information. That's correct. And they are not guaranteed infallibility yep. and factual information unless... That factual information is necessary to maintain in order to preserve something that is dogmatic. That's correct. And there's nothing to preserve the dogma that, of, of what has been revealed in the first century to say that Honorius is, is a heretic, right? That's the, correct. The, the, those things are, are two completely separate things. Now, he, he has made another good point as well, and, and I'll ask you what your thoughts are. Number one, that, that point he made I thought was good. It's pretty much virtually identical yeah. to the way you've laid it out. The other point is is uh, the question of was he in heresy? Yeah, you know I think that's a good one because uh, something that Eric has also brought mm -hmm. to my attention a while back. He's done a lot of great work, as you know, on sure the papacy. In, yeah. in my opinion, best guy yeah. out there on the papacy, no doubt. Um, he he brought out the fact that well, John the Fourth, Pope John the Fourth, yep. one of the successors of of uh, Honorius wrote an apology mm -hmm. for Honorius. And this apology, I, I read through it, and yeah, it, it, it makes sense. And it shows, okay, that it sure does seem to be the case that Honorius was not actually teaching something right. heretical. Um, what's also curious is at the Sixth Ecumenical Council, it doesn't seem like they accounted for that. That's it correct. doesn't seem like they really asked well, what did he mean? And, yep. and look into the defense for Those are all very Honorius. important points. They didn't really look into yeah. it. So then, okay, is it possible that the council can err on a condemnation of an individual? Yes. yes. The only matters of fact, like I said, that are could be within the scope of the church's infallibility is if they are logically or necessarily, yeah. necessarily related to a dogma. Like, for example, you can't say Jesus is divine, the dogma right. that Jesus is divine, without saying that Jesus also existed historically. Yep. That's so correct. the church can definitively teach Jesus was a historical person yeah. because it's impossible to maintain that Jesus is divine without also saying he's That's correct. A, a historical person. Well, at least I, 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 I guess if we exclude the incarnation, let me maybe rephrase it. It's impossible to say that he's fully divine and fully man. That's correct. Uh, without saying that he did yeah. not actually pierce and come into history. Didn't exist. Yeah. So those things fall within the scope of the church's infallibility. But. Are things like uh, so and so actually believes this yeah. in his heart, or five plus five equals ten? Right. Are those things within Definitely the not. scope of the church's infallibility? I don't think so. Definitely not. And that is a good point. I, I think what it really comes down to, Michael, is the fact of what papal infallibility really is must be defined. Yeah. People need to understand it. Yeah. And then here's another thing that I hear very often from Catholics, and, and, and I don't agree with it, is the idea that papal infallibility has only been exercised yeah. twice. That's what I hear the, right. the majority of the time right. in church history. And, of course, what they're referring to is um, uh, Munificentissimus Deus yeah, yeah. and um, the Apostolic Constitution yeah. on uh, the Immaculate Conception. Right. So... Um, Ineffabilis Deus. Yeah. So I don't agree with that. Right. And I think usually that comes from the group of individuals that may not understand what papal infallibility mm -hmm. is. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that? that... Yeah, it, it especially today does. Yeah. Their point originally seems to come from a few group, uh, a, a select group of theologians 
that were in dialogue with Lutherans. Yeah. And I think what they were trying to do is downplay papal infallibility yep. to be more ecumenically sure. palatable to Protestants. And yep. I, you know, I, as great as it is to build relations with the Protestants, we don't want to sacrifice yeah. <laughs> papal infallibility just for that, right? And that's the important thing. Uh, it, it, to become ecumenical to the point of removing very key teachings of the faith yeah. or denying them is problematic. Yeah. And I think that's the number one point that we have to focus upon. Yeah. And when we do focus upon that and we realize, okay, uh, are we sacrificing yeah. something of the faith? Then that is problematic. And some might say, well, you guys sound like you're doing that with Pope Honorius. I don't think so for the yeah. reasons why we said, but let's just say that he actually did teach heresy. Yeah. Okay. I think that that's still compatible with papal infallibility because sure. he clearly wasn't teaching it definitively. Yep. Moreover, I would understand him to have been condemned as a heretic as far as if he was properly condemned. Right. I would say it was material, even though there's language about him sharing in the impiety right. of Sergius and others. Yes, but that doesn't mean that he formally was a heretic. I While agree. those guys may have been, yeah. I don't think that it necessarily means that he had to be formally obstinate against the truth or something like that. Granted, no, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, here, here's another thing that um, that I that I find very interesting, and and. Um, I'm going to throw you for a loop here. Yeah. Uh, it rarely gets brought up. Yeah. Um, it has to do with the papacy, of course. Mm. It has to do with, uh, with the Council of Trent. So okay. here's an interesting thing that right now that I've noticed brought up very often, mm. uh, and this has to do with authority. By the Eastern Orthodox, they, they, as you know very well, have a different canon of Scripture than we do. Yeah. They have a relatively larger, more, more times than not. They utilize other books in the yeah. Septuagint. Now, here is the interesting thing, Michael. If we look in church history, Council of Rome, Hippo, mm -hmm. Carthage, mm -hmm. Septuagint was never canonized. Mm -hmm. The church fathers never gathered and, and included those books as part of sacred scripture. What we find identical at Trent was what we find throughout history at Rome, mm -hmm. Hippo, Carthage, the exact list. So... The reason I bring that up in, rel in relativity to talking about the papacy mm -hmm. is how important authority is. Yeah. Because then I can ask an, an Eastern Christian, yeah. by what authority do you hold to that longer canon? Yeah. Now, I've heard arguments brought up, well, you know, this council or that council. There are no ecumenical councils that formally define the canon the mm -hmm. way Florence and Trent do. So to me, that's another issue that they have with authority the issue of the canon. Yeah. And I've heard the arguments, Michael, of a certain council uh, adopting the Trullian canons, mm. and okay, this is where the um, where we get our, our canon of scripture mm -hmm. from, okay. but that's a big problem, because a number of those, those books at there that were adopted, a lot of them were apocryphal. Mm. So here we go right back to the issue of authority. And the issue of authority, to me, there's a glaring issue over there on the other end, yeah, in Eastern I th Orthodox. I think that, for me, is the deal breaker. Yeah. Um, the magisterium, church authority, yeah. papal supremacy, infallibility. Um, not only do I see attestation yeah. to these things historically, but also the a priori argument of it would make sense that Christ's church would have this. Yeah. That, to me, is, is an important thing to consider yep. yes it's not a, it's not something that would seal the deal i understand that just because it would make sense to have it doesn't necessarily mean that christ would do it that way because god has done some things that don't sure. necessarily make sense to us right, right? yeah and, and and so yeah that doesn't seal the deal right but i do think that that should be placed on the scales to yeah. add weight to the catholic it position. has got to be placed there in the scales to add weight it has to and then the, the one thing we have not even delved into because it would take so much longer is yeah is is the overwhelming amount of testimony in the early church fathers yeah where we look at their writings and they're not only indicating this leadership of saint peter from the scripture they're also indicating it from the successor of St. Peter. Yeah. And you find this all throughout the early church fathers. 
It is not a novelty. It is not a little quote bite or ripping out of context. It is yeah. historically there. The thing, the only rival ecclesiology that I see in the first millennium to the Catholic ecclesiology of the Pope um, is the ecclesiology that involves the emperor sure. to gather yeah. bishops. Now, How are you going to do that today? <laughs> that's the problem. Yeah. You don't have that. Now, I understand that it wasn't just the emperor acting alone entirely. Although sometimes he did at sure. some of the ecumenical councils, yeah. some of the decisions that were put forward right. was simply because of the emperor. Um, there, there's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. But I understand that sometimes the bishops were involved and he just kind of gathered them together. Sure. But the thing is, you don't have an emperor to do that today. So you, do not. you still have the bishops, yeah. but you don't have the emperor to gather them, to convoke ecumenical councils, to um, say that this is going to be ecumenical and problems like that. So to me, the only other rival ecclesiology that's in the first millennium doesn't exist today. Yeah. Now, what I've heard some people say is, well, okay, well, we don't have an empire, but we have something like the United Nations. Sure. Maybe you, the United Nations could call an ecumenical council. Right. The, the how, how, do you, how do you feel about the UN calling an ecumenical yeah. council? Yeah. <laughs> how, how, that, that, the idea of that ever working is just <laughs> absolutely ludicrous, Michael. Yeah, it, it really, to me... But, but you know what, Michael? It's important that we talk about that yeah, because yeah. it highlights the major glaring problem on the other side. Mm. The fact that you would even have to imply that or suggest that. Well, the answer for us is quite simple. We yeah. have the successor yeah. to St. Peter. And we don't have that same kind of problem. Now, are you going to say, well, you know what? You, you just admitted mm. that sometimes your pope is not very clear. Mm -hmm. Sure, but we have the successor, St. Peter, and we look and we examine what he says, and a lot of what people are claiming is being ripped out of context. But I tell you one other thing, Michael. I know a good amount of people that have left the church because they think the grass is greener on the other side. Like, oh, we're, you know, we're sick and tired of liberal, for instance. We're sick and tired of liberalism. Well, I'll tell you one thing. Grass is not greener right. on the other side. Right. Um, because this lack of authority... Mm. You're going to be entering uh, somewhere, another church where the honeymoon phase will end very yeah. fast. Yeah. And you're going to realize, well, goodness, the same kind of problems that are there in Catholicism are glaringly bad here. And there is no authority to ever alleviate this, these problems. That's the difference. Because yeah. some are going to say, okay, as you noted... All right, well, some things sound confusing coming yeah. from Pope Francis. Okay, but the church can always come back and oh, clarify yeah. something. Yep. You can always They've do done that it. with a magisterium, and yep. they have done that. Yeah. Um, whereas with the Orthodox, when you lack an objective magisterium, you can't come back and clarify right. yourself. Yeah. And you can't come back and definitively settle a dispute. And that is a major problem. And I think when we, because we have to weigh the arguments fairly and when we begin to weigh them fairly michael and and we look at scripture church history delve into the council look michael just read the language of the yeah. councils yeah and if you think that if you read the language of nicaea too chalcedon uh any of these popes that we brought up and you can come back to me and tell me no they, they didn't believe in papal supremacy mm. or papal mm. primacy then you need to read them again. Well, see, that that's the thing. You have Orthodox scholars who will yeah. themselves know, yeah, the seeds of Vatican I is here in the formula of her yeah. and yeah. And so you even have Orthodox scholars who will recognize it. Yeah. They don't accept sure. Vatican I ecclesiology, sure. but they will say, yeah, the idea was there in the first millennium. We yeah. just reject it in the same way that we would reject Donatism in the first millennium sure. or something like that. And, and the big problem with that, though, is that these claims were being made in the first millennium, Michael, and they were considered orthodox. Mm -hmm. And I mean orthodox with a tiny. Sure, sure. So it's not like, well, okay, the claims exist the way Gnosticism existed or the way uh, these other heresies existed. No. This was a mark of orthodoxy, mm -hmm. a mark of being a part of the true church. And there is no parallelism, in my opinion, to comparing these claims to a heretical group of claims. That, sure. or, or to saying, look, oh, they, the claims were made, 
but they were never widely accepted. Oh, they were widely accepted. Mm. Man, well, there's so many places that I want to go that, with this when it, when it comes to the papacy. Yeah. Um, what would you say to people who are who are saying, okay, well, maybe Pope Francis is misunderstood, but there are clearly popes historically that are problematic and involved yeah. in all kinds of scandals. Don't you think that undermines the credibility of the papacy? That's a great example. Now, that's a, a great point you bring yeah. up. It doesn't, because the office of the Pope is not predicated upon the holiness of the particular individual. Now, here's another thing. We do, people will say, well, you call him the Holy Father. Sure, we call him yeah. as he should emulate his character, as he should be, right. uh, as he should portray himself. Now, we've had some pretty bad Popes throughout history, and we've had some incredible, great, pious, and amazing Popes throughout history. That's pretty much just the nature of our human character our fallen human nature we have had some bad popes but the thing is none of these bad popes have ever steered the universal church towards heresy none of them have ever uh declared something such as gnosticism to be the truth mm -hmm. over the true faith mm -hmm. so the church from the beginning well look if you want to talk about popes that weren't perfect saint, yeah. saint peter denied our Lord three times. So we have examples of popes being imperfect from the very beginning. Yeah. But that has no bearing at all on the office of being the shepherd of the Christians. I think that's the most important part we have to recognize. Now I'm going to get controversial here. <laughs> Do you think that it is possible for the church to depose a pope? Hmm. That's a great not great. not in a conciliarism way. Right. Obviously, that's excluded by Vatican One. Yeah. We're not talking about conciliarism. Yeah, in that a non-conciliarist yeah. way, do you think yeah. it's possible uh, for the Church to depose a pope? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I don't. And why? Um, I'm trying. I'm trying to think of um, a detailed reason. Yeah. What What is your position on that? I'm. I. You do I believe. I go back and forth. You go like, back and forth. One day I'm, I, I say, yeah, the next day I'm like, I don't know. Yeah, that, that's a good hypothetical. <laughs> There's some really strong arguments yeah. on both sides, you know. I, yeah. I, I think that if the church were to come out and really give me something objective, yeah. I, 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 could, I could see it. Now, some might say, okay, well, you do have the Fifth Ecumenical Council suspending Vigilius. Sure. Were they going beyond their authority? That's questionable. Yeah. Maybe they were. Um, now, you also have the Eighth Ecumenical Council where there's a canon in there. I believe it's Canon 23. Um, and it talks about the Pope. If the Pope is going to be judged, right. it has to be with caution. Yeah. Okay. All right. Are they talking about judging him as far as deposing him? Yeah, we'd have to know like what kind that. of judgment are they talking right, about. Right, right. Yeah. That's that's one thing. But then another po counterpoint is it seems like the context there is the council judging a pope in communion with a pope. In other words, right. the council in communion with a pope judging a past pope. Yeah, a past pope. That does seem yeah. to be the issue. Now... Another thing that I've noted in, in, in a number of saints that talk about that hypothetical situation, um, I've seen them hypothetically postulate a pope that is in pertinent heresy, yeah. that is in, in that has been warned right. multiple times, right. according to the biblical teaching of Titus, yeah. uh, the book of Titus. Uh, that, but again, each of these saints have yeah. noted in a hypothetical Di kind of manner. Different, and there's different views there. Some yes. are saying that he would be automatically deposed. Right. Others are saying that this would never even happen. Yes, and I then, believe St. Bellarmine, uh, Robert Bellman. Yeah, he didn't think that it would ever didn't happen. Didn't think it would ever happen. But he yes. thought that, okay, well, if it does happen, he would be autumn he would automatically fall sure. from office yes but then there's others who would say okay well even if he automatically falls from office you still have to have the church that declares it sure so sure. an imperfect ecumenical council right. would declare that god has deposed yeah. this pope from the the church otherwise it's just kind of up to every individual to say well i think the pope's been deposed yeah and and, and th that's a great point you bring up michael because 
that has never been the model of the church <laughs> yeah. for uh, you know your everyday uh, person to just walk down the street and say, "Hey, right. uh, that person is not the Pope because they're in in heresy. Mm -hmm. They're a formal heretic, uh, or any kind of judgment, uh, yeah. you know, by a mere person that has no credentials at all." Yeah. Unfortunately, we're living in a time right now where uh, some people that consider themselves scholars or theologians mm -hmm. that don't have the qualifications do make those kinds of judgments and i find it to be problematic mm. usually you find this kind of language utilized by those that just really haven't studied the issue very well or very in depth for a catholic there's there's a curious canon also again at the eighth ecumenical council that notes that a person cannot separate from their patriarch yeah. unless their patriarch has been deposed by right. a synod yep. um so you as an individual just can't make that call and right. think Oh, I think my patriarch's a heretic. I'm out. Yeah. Now, the problematic aspect is there are some canons for Orthodox that would actually praise individual yeah. laity to separate from a clergy if they, as a layman, think yeah. that they're teaching heresy. I, I find the Catholic paradigm to make more sense here because otherwise it's just going to be every man for themselves. They're, they're going to think... Well, I think so-and-so is a heretic, or I think so-and-so yep. is a heretic, and so everybody's just going to go their own way. And that is a model of chaos. I think so. It, it truly is a model that leads down a very chaotic road, and I think, I, I truly think the way the church is laid out is a very safe manner in the sense that uh, we have authority, and mm -hmm. our authority does make sense. And we're not trying to reinvent what has happened in history. Mm -hmm. Rather, we're looking at such as Honorius. Yeah. We look at the curious case of Honorius, we examine it, we study it, and we say, okay, well, what is the issue? How can we respond to this? And then it, it turns out that other individuals later on in history saw it the, pretty much the exact same way. So we're not on an island alone or reinventing, yeah. uh, you know, any yeah. kind of history here. You know, and at the end of the day, though there are some question marks on this issue of can a pope be deposed? Yeah. And if so, how? Though there are some question marks here, yeah. the thing about Catholicism is it is able to offer yeah. a definitive settlement on these issues whenever it becomes necessary. Yes. Whereas when I look at other communions and I were to ask similar questions, they don't have an objective magisterium, so they can't settle a matter definitively. Yeah. Th th that, that to me, Michael, has always been a massive issue. The fact that in other faith communions, as beautiful as they may be, mm -hmm. because I, I will be the first to tell you, uh, these Eastern Orthodox churches are beautiful. Yeah, a lot of the Oriental Orthodox churches oh, are yeah. beautiful. They're great. Yeah, but uh, beauty doesn't mean truth. Yeah. Now, do we are, are we then saying, well, these are not uh, apostolic in any manner? No, we're not saying that at all. But we believe we have the fullness of the truth, and I stand by that. And as the years have gone by since I heavily discerned orthodoxy and chose Catholicism, I have not regretted my decision. Mm. Now, are there ever moments when I say, man, you know, this, this ship yeah. is moving and swaying back and forth? Of yeah. course. Yeah. Great saints have said that. Um, but we have this authority. We have the magisterium. We have the successor of St. Peter. And I think if you want to weigh which faith is... Biblical and traditional, divine tradition, it's going to have to be Catholicism. Well said. Yeah. William, tell me a little bit about your channel and your material. Put in a plug for anything awesome. you want to make Yeah, audience. definitely. Yeah. So people can find me, find a lot of my debates here, right here at Recent yep. Theology, doing a lot of great stuff in the future. They can check out stuff I'm doing over at Patristic Pillars. Check out my webpage at patristicpillars.com or go to earlychurchfathers.com. It'll take you directly there. Now... I am working on a book of the papacy, mm. very different to other books. It's very much uh, devoted to Isaiah chapter 22 and Matthew 16 primarily. Now, the key thing there is Father Coppes has gotten translations from church fathers that we don't have in English mm -hmm. that will be available in that book. It'll be heavily devoted to that. Now, there are other books out there coming out. Eric has an incredible book coming mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. Ours is completely different. Ours deals with that issue mainly. Mm -hmm. Eric's is going to be a monster, massive, incredible book. So we recommend you check both out. 
And I'm dealing, uh, doing a lot of work in Mariology. I recommend people check that out. In fact, we'll be having a debate either in the fall or winter time. Reason and Theology will be hosting it. So a lot of great stuff going on here. I recommend people, hey, stay on board. If you're watching this early, uh, that means you're supporting the channel. Yeah. Keep supporting the channel because your support, I've got to tell you, is the reason we can do things like this. Your support is the reason we can have fun shows. Yeah. And hey, your support is the reason we can do our research True. and help present the material if you've enjoyed it. Please continue supporting. Yeah, and, and even bring out guests such as yourself. Absolutely. So, yeah, it's, it's greatly, greatly appreciated. Absolutely. William, thank you so much for coming on, sir. Hey, what I got to tell you, the conversation was incredible and so was the beer. Thank you. <laughs> it was good. Everybody, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Patrons, I already know y'all are subscribed. But for everybody who sees this later on after early access, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Check me out. Also, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to become a patron and get early access to other stuff and extra content uh, in addition to early access. So, all right, that's going to do it. We'll see y'all later.